we need to talk. Look, it's not you. It's about the SeaWiz controller. Now, I'm going to try to keep this tutorial very specific to the SeaWiz controller as much as I can. Although, of course, there is always a relationship between the SeaWiz controller, the SeaWiz system, I did it, the SeaWiz built on top of that controller, the projectiles that you're trying to shoot down, and the maneuvering capabilities of the craft that is on it. All of these are related to each other, and to some extent I will have to talk about them, but the intended focus about this is the SeaWiz controller block itself. There are two primary systems that you want to use it on. One is a predominantly defensive system that will have no local weapon controller, only a SeaWiz controller. Typically, this will use missile interceptors. You can also do this with either a purely defensive laser setup that uses a laser combiner, a LAMS function independently from this, or you can do it with belt blasters because they have a limited firing time. However, if you were using APS and you were using them only defensively, something has gone wrong. So I would typically suggest that this system where you only have a SeaWiz controller and no local weapon controller is only used for missile interceptors because missile interceptors have no offensive role and they're more efficient than any of the other defensive countermeasures, except against the APS shells, which they can't engage against, but LAMs can. And now let's look at the other systems. At a very basic level, you have an all-in-one weapon controller, and you have a SeaWiz controller. Generally speaking, you want the defensive role of these systems to take priority, otherwise you wouldn't even have a SeaWiz controller. So you take your all-in-one weapons controller, and you have its priority set low, and you have your SeaWiz controller, and its priority is set at anything higher than that. So if you're not shooting at missiles, you're shooting at the enemy. If there are missiles to shoot down or cram cannons, you're shooting at those. And the first options that are presented to you when you open up this interface are your aiming settings. As far as I can tell, detection of enemy projectiles is exact which means that this option should almost always be picked. So this uses second derivatives, and second derivatives become very bad as soon as there's noise in the equation, which is why they're not even really offered as an option for enemy vehicles where you have detection errors. If detection errors are ever introduced for projectiles, you may want to question your use of this, but you will almost always see a benefit to using this. Because most enemy projectiles, because most enemy projectiles have incredibly consistent acceleration. For example, until they hit the range fall off, frame cannon shells have constant acceleration, which means that this will be perfect for use against them. And missiles have constant thrust, although they have variable air resistance and they have fins and that sort of thing. They also tend to be fairly predictable, although this will be much less noticeable against them. Then you have the aiming settings. Typically, you just want idle aim at enemy. There's really no reason to use any of the other settings. And then there's this other option, skip main rule set for locked target, which presents you with basically two modes, three in a certain manner of speaking, because you have a main rule set that gets used for every projectile, a locked target rule set, which only gets applied to the current rule set, and one that lets you skip this rule set for the locked target. So you can either have one for all projectiles, something added onto it, or something for all projectiles and something different for one specific target. I only ever use the main rule set because I don't care where my projectiles are coming from, I just care about their properties. I haven't particularly found a use for doing other anything other than simply having a main rule set. Okay, so now we get into the main rule set. And we basically have two different classes of options that do not interact with each other. So there's ignore inside and ignore outside. These are Boolean options and they're filters that basically you, you apply a bunch of these 
and either a projectile passes this filter or it fails this filter. If a projectile passes all filters, it will be accepted into the waiting mode. And then if you're familiar with sort of target prioritization cards where each enemy is assigned a weight and or each category gives a weight for an enemy. You sum all the weights and then the highest weighted enemy is the target. This is similar, that you have a bunch of weight functions, you sum them all up, the highest weighted projectile is the target. And then you have a bunch of different options. And there are a bunch of them that say computationally expensive. I have never used these, but I will still go through how they could potentially be useful and perhaps what the performance concerns of using them are, although I've not benchmarked them. The first one, distance. Distance between the weapon and the projectile. Very typically, you will use an ignore outside for this. And for example, let's say your vehicle fights at 1500 meters, and it is very reliable at enforcing that 1500 meter range. You might set a range like this so that you do not shoot at enemy missiles while they're leaving the enemy craft, which gives you two things. One, if they have distraction sticks on the enemy vehicle, you won't shoot at them. And two, missiles tend to have very large changes in velocity that are quite unpredictable when they leave the enemy vehicle, but they straighten out after that. So you're just going to miss them a lot when, you're, when they're leaving the enemy vehicle. Additionally, it is hard to shoot at projectiles that come too close to you. Sort of their angular velocity, which is if, you're, if your turret's tracking them, how fast they move compared to the turret in terms of the angle change, that tends to get very high as a projectile gets very close, and you lose the ability to track the enemy projectile. And that causes your turret to just swing, a, swing around a lot and never shoot at anything. How high you set this will often depend on how quickly your turret can rotate, or if there are missiles on it, how good they are at engaging close enemy missiles. Typically, you will also want to weight this. And generally speaking, you would have some value for the range minimum that's high and some value for the range maximum that's low so that you prioritize missiles that are closer to you rather than further, further ones. Altitude. I rarely use rate weight for altitude. However, ignore outside is typically highly useful. Let's say you're building a submarine. Well, missiles will never hit you, which means you're just not interested in projectiles that are over the water. And missiles will often enter the water a little bit, so usually you would do something that doesn't shoot at many missiles that kind of graze the water. Conversely, you might be building an airship and you're not interested in shooting at torpedoes. The torpedoes might breach a little bit though, so if your airship doesn't fly that low, you might bump up the minimum range a little bit. Speed. I typically don't weight speed either, however, slow missiles or torpedoes will rarely hit your vehicle. You may want to be careful about applying this towards weapons that can't shoot at torpedoes because uh, slow torpedoes are more likely to hit you than slow missiles because if a missile's slow, it's because it doesn't have any fuel left. But this can be useful to avoid shooting at missiles that have run out of gas. I don't typically use this, but it could be useful. It can also avoid shooting at distraction sticks that are being towed by slower vehicles. Angle of incidence. Angle between the velocity of the projectile and the direction from the projectile to the weapon. The value is zero if the projectile is directly moving toward the weapon. 180 if it, if it is moving away from the weapon. Use this to avoid aiming at projectiles moving away. It is what it says. I typically don't weight this either, but I will set something like this. You will want to test a filter like this against a variety of craft because it often leads to you not shooting at projectiles that you need to be shooting at. This filter is not as useful as it could be. There is one that we will talk about later that is in the computationally expensive category that provides something that's more useful. However, this filter is very useful 
on a slow moving vehicle. But something, something to watch out for is the faster your vehicle is moving, the worse this filter is. I have been building a lot of very slow vehicles lately, and this filter is very useful for them. But if you are a fast moving vehicle, you will find a high level of error on this filter. Vehicles to test against are ones like the Asphodel that launch very high arcing projectiles. If you have this set too tight, you will tend to find that you don't shoot at those types of missiles until they're way too late. A lot of the Steel Striders missiles fall into this category, so be very careful about setting this too low. If you set this too high, you will tend to find that you shoot against either projectiles that are missing you entirely, very common with crime cannons, or projectiles that are meant for another vehicle in your fleet. You may or may not want this. If you're using kinetic seawiz, you are very unlikely to hit these projectiles, and you will want to trim them out. If you're using flak seawiz or missile seawiz, or even laser seawiz is a good one as well, you will tend to hit these projectiles, and you will want to leave them in. Target azimuth. Azimuth of the direction from the weapon to the projectile relative to the front of the construct. So your bow would be 0 degrees off of your stern would be 180. I have never used this. However, if you have a very fast vehicle, projectiles off of your bow will be very likely to hit you soon. Projectiles off of your stern are likely to miss you entirely or to take a long time to get to you. If you put SeaWiz on an incredibly quick moving vehicle, this is a computationally inexpensive way to prioritize projectiles that will hit you sooner rather than later. And to do something like that, I would say wait, and wait at range minimum because you want ones that are near 0 degrees rather than near 180, and I'd probably stretch the range all the way to 180. However, I have not used this. Target rear azimuth is this with the bounds flipped. I don't know why it exists, because you can flip the bounds with these, so you don't need to flip the bounds with these. Target elevation is the same as azimuth, except it's up and down rather than left and right. This is a little interesting. I haven't used it, but there is some potential here. And the reason that there's some potential here, I feel, is that the, mis the way that missiles are designed is fundamentally flawed. Unless we ever get Missiles 2.0, those flaws will never be fixed. Draba, who puts the miss in missiles, is certainly intelligent enough to understand what's wrong with them. Although missile bugs don't actually get assigned to them, they get assigned to Jonathan, as far as I'm aware from the bug reports that I've written. And in this game, they will never get fixed. I have talked about them in some of my other vehicles, but uh, missiles to some extent suffer from gimbal locking problems. It's largely because they have an assigned, like they don't actually lock, but th their error gets higher and higher the closer to straight up or the closer to straight down they point. It, it has a few issues. Part of it is due to the way the spherical coordinates work, the other is due to the fact that they have an assigned top side and an assigned bottom side, so they can't actually flip poles, they just have to spin around 180 degrees to get to the other side. If you have a flying vehicle, you may want to use this to deprioritize missiles that are very close to being above you or very close to being below you, because those missiles are unlikely to hit you because of these defects with missiles. I haven't used this, but it is potentially something potentially something that you could use. If you are interested on the subject, there are probably a lot of informational videos on YouTube about it. If you look up Gimbal Lock, if you look up Quaternions, that sort of thing. I'm not saying that Quaternions are a necessary concept to avoid this, it's just they're often a concept that is used to avoid this, so if you search for them, you will find this topic a lot. If you if you watch videos about the BBS Reamer, my vehicle, there's one or two of them. The one where I actually talk about the creation of it, I go a little bit more in depth into the subject and my design because the Reamer does, despite functioning very much like a missile, does not suffer from these problems. And 
This is inherent in the way that missiles are designed. You cannot get away you cannot get around this by writing Lua for missiles. Offset to aim. Angle between weapon current direction and the direction to aim. Computationally expensive, which is why I haven't used it. This is something that would potentially be incredibly, incredibly useful. But you'd want to wait angle you'd want to wait projectiles that are close to your current angle more highly. And this is one of the ones that is fundamentally it's fundamentally baked into how you build your CWIS for whether or not you care about this. If you're launching missiles, you probably don't care about this. However, if you're shooting lasers, you still might not care about this because if you're not shooting lasers, you're storing laser energy, but you might care about this a little bit. But if it's an APS CWIS, you typically want an incredibly high rate of fire for APS CWIS so that you avoid overkilling projectiles more than is strictly required. But that has the downside of the fact that if your gun is traversing, your gun isn't firing. If your gun isn't firing, it's an expensive paperweight. And because of that, you always want to select your next projectile to be close to the current aim of your current one. So this could be incredibly, incredibly useful to avoid picking more, more targets than you have to. The reason that it might be expensive is because you have to calculate the offset. And this will require two inverse trigonometric calls. These are typically very fast. And I, I can't particularly say how, um, basically how the Unity engine runs scripts. Depending on how they work, you may find that a subtraction and an inverse trigonometric function take roughly the same amount of time because all of your overhead is is actually in language processing. And the low-level machine calls themselves are very, very fast once you call into the necessary language. On the other hand, you may find that they're actually more expensive. I, I can't actually say. I don't know enough about Unity. What I would say is that in terms of computational cost, this is probably at the low end. And it is very useful. I haven't used this, but it is something that I should consider using. However, there is a reason why computationally expensive CWIS controller options should maybe be taken carefully. And it's because with things like a missile, when they're evaluating their flight characteristics to intercept a target, for each missile, they only have to do this for their current target. For their actual evaluation of the target that they need, they have to consider every enemy vehicle. However, for these CWIS controllers, they have to do this operation for every missile. And every CWIS controller has to do this for every missile. It's n times m. It's not the sort of thing that you like. Okay, and then you can do azimuth and elevation separately. These are going to be very similar to offset. The azimuth, the aim, relative to the front of the construct. Um, this is really... Uh, presenting no difference between target azimuth and target rear azimuth. Angle between the weapon current azimuth and the azimuth to aim. But azimuth to aim and target azimuth are, are fundamentally fairly similar, except for the fact that target azimuth and target rear azimuth are relative to your construct. They need to be calculated once for your entire construct per frame, as opposed to these two, which are relative to your turret. I would say that these, which are for just compared to, I imagine that these are just compared to the subconstruct that you are manipulating here. These would be more accurate than the non-computationally expensive ones. And if you have a small number of CWIS controllers, will come with a very small computational overhead. So, you know, maybe use these, maybe not. The further away a missile is, the less difference these will make. I would say if you have, you know, two CWIS controllers on your vehicle, always use these instead. You know, if you have eight or nine or ten, maybe you should use these. I haven't benchmarked them, so I don't know how expensive they are. I suspect that there, that there is not a very large difference in computational cost. So maybe just use the computationally expensive ones that are more accurate. 
And if you start seeing real performance degradations, just don't use them. Interception distance. I have not used this one, but this one is potentially incredibly useful. The distance between the weapon and the projectile at the predicted moment of intersection. This is a, that is not a good way of phrasing this. There is a very short phrase. It's distance to intercept. And I've been building a lot of slow vehicles. I have no reason to use this. Because distance for a slow vehicle is effectively the same as interception distance because you're not moving. But if you build very fast vehicles, like some of my water skimmers, you will want to use this instead of distance. What this, so what this is, is it calculates based on how you're moving and based on how the enemy projectile is moving, roughly how far are you from that intersection point? This is, the cost on this is what, like, off the top of my head, like nine multiplications. It's not super expensive. And so it's, it's going to be cheaper than the inverse trigonometric functions, I believe. It is also possibly going to be done in a single function call to a, a low-level operation, which would potentially make it as cheap as a lot of other things. I, I would say always use this over distance for fast vehicles. And the reason why is, let's say you're going 150 meters per second, and you see a missile off of the bow. If that missile is going to hit you, you're going to be coming up on that interception very, very quickly. And it's actually going to hit you in a closer location toward, to your current position than a missile that's chasing you off the stern. An equally distance missile that's chasing you off the stern that's just barely going faster than you might hit you a kilometer away, two kilometers away. One coming off the bow, it's going to hit you soon. And this is basically always superior to just using distance. Acceleration, I don't really see any purpose for this, so I'm not going to talk about it. Cluster size, this seems like it could be very useful. It's not actually as useful as it could be. The approximate number of detected projectiles within 30 meters from the projectile. This has a deep flaw in that it doesn't matter how far away the projectiles are. So when you want to target clusters, you want to target the center of the cluster. This doesn't really help you do that because of how projectiles tend, like missiles tend to be launched in salvos. And a lot of the time they're just all kind of close together. And this will just help you shoot at one of the missiles in the salvo. Which, you know, if you're using flak weaponry, that might be nice if you're fighting an enemy vehicle that launches one decoy kinetic missile that leads the pack by a significant margin. This will be very nice. It can help you avoid shooting at that. Or you can put cluster size. You know, you can crank up the weight for big clusters. And it'll help you in very specific cases where you have those, like, lone, those lone missiles that are just there as a bunch of hit points to distract you from the actual damaging ones and let your flak just absolutely decimate the pack of lower hit points but much more damaging missiles behind them. You'll find this very useful against a select group of Steel Striders craft that use these sorts of tactics, but because of the fact that they don't help you target the middle of the pack, they're not nearly as useful as they could be. Still selective use there. Shots fired. Numbers of shots fired from any projectile sea whiz at the projectile from any sea whiz. Right, so typically you, you'd want to use it like this so that you target projectiles that you haven't shot rather than ones that you have. You can, you can use this if you want a craft that is really highly tuned against another vehicle to avoid overkilling its missiles. However, the more useful purpose for this is that if you have a very fast vehicle, missiles that are not fast and maneuverable won't hit you. And missiles' speed and maneuverability degrades as they take damage. So if you just spray a bunch of shots, add a bunch of missiles coming at you, and slow them all down a little bit, well, they might miss you. It, you don't have to kill them. However, if you're a slow vehicle and they're going to hit you anyway, you may not want to do this because this causes you to change targets more often. And if you're changing targets more often, you are not shooting while you're changing targets, most likely. And you just aren't using your Sea Whiz to its maximum potential. 
number of C was aiming. I've never, I've never used this, but this could be incredibly useful if you to sort of achieve a similar effect to shots fired, except without retargeting as often. If you have a bunch of guns and you want them to target a bunch of missiles to just degrade the performance of those missiles without necessarily killing them, well, this could give you that kind of effect. Definitely, if you're using shots fired and you're using multiple CWIS, you probably also want to use number of CWIS aiming. It will reduce the amount of retargeting that you have. Type of projectile, one for missile, two for crab shell. I don't terribly use this as much as projectile diameter, which includes both cram shell diameter and missiles 250 for small 500 for medium 1000 for large 2000 for huge and i often want to both weight so if you're using kinetic seawiz that you really like to use to kill solitary big missiles well you want to shoot it you'd want to shoot at big projectiles so you'd prefer to weight the large ones Inversely, if you have flak, you might prefer to shoot at the small ones and do it the opposite way. However, the way that I use this a lot is ignore outside. Right, because if I'm using kinetic CWIS, I don't want to shoot at small missiles. So, small missiles, 250. Well, I'll set it 253. We'll shoot at everything that's not a small missile. I find that, well, for a lot of systems, is a little bit better than weight. Something like flak, you still want it to be able to shoot at large missiles, even if you don't usually want to shoot at them compared to the small missiles. Something like the laser system on the Deimos does not use this. It needs this filter added to it. If you've seen it in the Most Wanted video that Borderwise has done, which if you are if you were watching this tutorial, I know that you've seen that. You've seen the defects of the Deimos, that if you shoot a bunch of small missiles at it, it is both costly for it to shoot its counter missiles at it and its main gun will shoot at them but that's a really bad right its main gun doesn't track very quickly and if you shoot a bunch of small missiles at it especially from multiple directions its main gun will just flail all over the place aiming at the small missiles and it'll do no damage a small number of cheap small missile craft can turn the demos into a paperweight very quickly if it had this filter on it that would not happen now, I think there are other issues with the Deimos. The Deimos should not be using its main gun to shoot down projectiles. This is really, really bad. It's a fundamental issue with, it, with the Deimos. You should never, ever do this on any of your vehicles. The thing that the Deimos should be doing is it should have smaller sub-lasers that shoot at projectiles if it wants to shoot down projectiles. Another thing to talk about, which... This really doesn't go into the CWIS controllers, but I've gotten invested on this topic at the moment, is that the reason to use laser combiners over LAMS nodes is that you can set laser combiners to do better damage at range. This is only good at range. You can only achieve this benefit for targets that you can shoot at range. Right? These targets are typically large missiles. Only use laser combiners against large missiles. Or, you know, other things that you can see at range. Otherwise, LAMS nodes are just superior. LAMS nodes, however, both have a fairly low maximum range and they have worse damage falloff. However, they do not need to turn to aim between projectiles and they are incredibly useful at frying large groups of small projectiles. What the Deimos should have is it should have a few CWIS turrets with laser combiners on them that shoot at larger projectiles, and then it should have LAMS nodes that shoot at smaller projectiles, and then it should have the main gun that is always shooting at the enemy no matter what. I've also done my own test against the Deimos. I've really, I've really seen the same things as Borderwise. I don't feel like he bashed the Deimos nearly as hard as he needed to. It is very close to being a very good vehicle, but the approach that it has to projectile defense is so deeply flawed that it can't 
it can't be justified as a hard mode vehicle as the way it is currently. Okay, so that's enough for the Seawiz controllers, except for one thing. I will load in one of my vehicles, doesn't really matter which one, and we'll see what is potentially the most useful aspect of Seawiz controllers. All right, so this is a very, very close up view of the cistern. Uh, an auspicious name, I know. You may or may not be familiar with her from my very hard neater playthrough. She showed up just at the end. Not really a fantastic vehicle, but kind of a fun one. This was my experiment into flax seawiz. And I, I look, I, I messed up a little bit here in the main rule set. She's on the workshop, but th there are two different problems there that I've, I've run into. I could, you know, leave that as an exercise to the reader that if you want to get better at seawiz, maybe take a look at her and figure out what the problems are. I, I looked through the seawiz before this tutorial and found them. That's a, that's a, a slight way of phrasing it that's more beneficial to me. It paints me in a better light than is reality. Uh, the reality being this is my second take at this tutorial. And I, I found the, the issues on the first take. It, it, it's not why I decided to redo this tutorial. I actually redo a lot of my videos nowadays. It's one of the reasons they're so much slower other than the fact that I got really sick two weeks ago. Anyway, we're talking about the most useful functionality of the Seawiz controller. Visualization. A circle is drawn around each detected projectile. Projectiles with gray circles are ignored. The projectile with the highest weight has a red circle, while the projectile with the lowest weight has a green circle. Other projectiles have colors in between that represent their relative weight. A line is drawn from the weapon to the current targeted projectile, the one with the highest weight. There is something that is slightly missing in this description. Projectiles that are not detected get no circles. This is very useful because it lets you differentiate between things that you are ignoring and things that you can't see. Set as persistent means that when I leave this menu, we will still see the visualization. So we've gotten to this point. I've left the visualization. We will spawn in an enemy vehicle that is maybe potentially useful for this. I'm going to put us both on god mode. And if we go over here. So one of the things to note is that we can see all of these projectiles, but we're ignoring a lot of them. This is because I have an angle of incidence set. Right, so these projectiles are going up like this. We're down here, that's a very high angle of incidence. These projectiles have started to come down towards us. Their angle of incidence has gotten very low, and we've started to shoot at them. And you can see our flak coming in and destroying them. Now, we, uh, we might have some detection issues actually, because I think that we're seeing these through visual cameras, and I don't think I have any that are pointing up. Um, this is potentially useful for debugging those as well. Potentially similar things with munition warning systems. This is why I should pay more attention when I'm building these craft. I'm usually very good at making sure that I have detection in the upwards direction. It seems to be missing on that. That actually explains a lot. This is why you should pay attention. Anyway. So these are being ignored, and they're being ignored based off of angle of incidence. This is very useful because I'm shooting vertically launched flares, and I'm distracting these missiles. I, I don't care about them. I don't want to shoot at them. This has been distracted, but the angle of incidence is still pretty close. Actually, this came back down. They got us over the over the flare. That's actually a little bad. Does it not have gotten one? No, it does. We're still we're just still racking up damage. And this shows some of the power of of flak seawiz, despite the fact that I don't like it compared to missile interceptors. There is also the torpedoes. They are typically ignored. And we prefer- they're ignored by this vehicle because we have torpedo poppers and I prefer to allow the torpedo poppers to shoot them. 
I hope you found this video to be informative. I'm hoping to do other Siwiz tutorials in the future, but this is the one that I felt most qualified to talk about in the very near term. In the future, I'd like to do some that are more about the actual weapons construction, but that is a very deeper topic, and one that I do not particularly feel... But I, I don't really feel like I have the required information to talk about at the moment. There's more testing required. I'm not sufficiently knowledgeable. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching, and I hope to see you in the future.